Godfrey continues in another blog with his astute observations. See Godfrey's comparisons here. One, you've got this divine command to sacrifice one's son. It's real in the case of Isaac, a lie in another in the case of Phrixus. Phrixus' stepmother bribed messengers to tell the father that God required the sacrifice. One, you, the father's pious, unquestioning submission to the command. Two, the last-minute deliverance of the human victim by a divinely sent ram. Direct command to the father in the case of Isaac. Direct command to the sacrificial victim in the case of Phrixus. Three, the fastening of the ram in a tree or bush. Before the sacrifice of the ram in the case of Isaac. After the sacrifice of the ram in the case of Phrixus. Four, the sacrifice of the ram as a substitute for Isaac, as a thanksgiving for Phrixus. What is significant is that these narrative units in common to both stories exist at a level independent of the particular stories. They can be inverted, reordered to create different stories. The question to ask is, are these units similar by coincidence or has one set been borrowed from the other? That particular detail about the ram in the tree or thicket is certainly distinctive enough to justify this question in relation to the whole set. Firstly, given that it is no longer considered quote-unquote fringe, except maybe among a large portion of American biblical scholars, where the influence of conservative and even evangelical religion is relatively strong, to consider the Bible's quote-unquote, Old Testament books being written as late as the Persian or even Hellenistic eras. And given the proximity of Jewish and Greek cultures, the possibility of direct borrowing cannot be rejected out of hand. Secondly, the chances of the Jewish story of the binding of Isaac being influenced by Greek myth is increased if both stories are located in a similar structural position within parallel narratives. Both near-human sacrifice narratives serve as the prologues to larger tales of, one, divine promises of a land to be inherited by a hero's descendants, two, a special divinely chosen people, three, a prearranged time schedule of four generations before the land would be inherited, four, Deliverance through a leader who initially protests because he stutters. Five, an additional delay because of human failure to hold fast to a divine promise. Six, a wandering through desert with a sacred vessel. Seven, guiding divine revelations along the way. Not only are both tales of escape from human sacrifice prologues to these larger comparative narratives, but they also serve as a reference point in both. They hold the respective larger stories together by serving as the origin point of the divine promises that guide the subsequent narratives of journeying to a promised land. And that origin point is referenced by way of reminder throughout the subsequent narratives. The biblical narrative is about much more than the way the children of Abraham inherited the land of Canaan. And here is where Philip Wachebaum, in his 2008 doctoral thesis, Argonauts of the Desert, Structural Analysis of the Hebrew Bible, draws attention to the extensive similarities between Plato's writings and the Bible's narratives. Both contain a general flood being the beginning of a new era in civilization, with a patriarchal age following the rise of cities and kingship and the development of laws and a description of an ideal state. The laws in the Pentateuch are often remarkably alike the laws proposed by Plato. You've got laws that require a central religious authority. You have laws of a need of, for pure bloodlines, especially for priests. Laws that condemn homosexuality, witchcraft, magic. Laws of inheritance, boundary stones. Laws of allowing slaves to be taken from foreign peoples only. 
laws against the need for a king, laws governing involuntary homicide, laws regarding rebellious children, laws against usury, against taking too much fruit from one's fields, and quite a few more, and often found listed in the same order between the Greek and Hebrew texts. The ideal state, moreover, is divided into 12 lots of land given to 12 tribes. The king, it is warned, is subject to the vices of love, and this will lead to oppressive tyranny. One might think here of the sins of David and Solomon. Wagenbaum applies the structural analysis of myths as developed by Claude Levi Strauss to the Bible, and one can see his coverage is much more extensive than can be covered in a few blog posts. Here is where Godfrey is focusing only on structural place of the Phrixus Isaac sacrifices in their respective wider narratives. The Phrixus episode serves as an introduction to the adventures of Jason and the Argonauts. And this set of adventures functions as an explanation of the founding of the Greek colony of Cyrene in North Africa, Libya. The Argonaut Epic and the Bible Narrative Neil Godfrey earlier written a series of six posts on the resonances between the Argonautica as told by Apollonius of Rhodes. They are found by starting at the bottom of this Argonautica archive, but this post is addressing Wagenbaum's thesis. The full Argonaut Epic is found in Pindar's fourth Pythian ode. It had earlier been referenced in Homer's Odyssey, Book 12, 69 to 72, and Hesiod's Theogony, 990 to 1005, and in Herodotus, the foundation of Cyrene and the interrupted sacrifice of Phrixus. Euripides wrote two plays titled Phrixus, now lost to us. And of course, Apollonius of Rhodes wrote the epic poem in imitation of Homer, the Argonautica. The main sources for this epic relate it to the founding of Cyrene. Pindar's ode is even dedicated to the king of Cyrene. This compares with the early Bible narrative from Abraham to Moses, relating to the settling of Canaan. Jason, leader of the Argonauts, belonged to the same extended family as Phrixus, all being descended from Aeolus. Zeus was angry with the descendants of Aeolus over the attempted sacrifice of Phrixus by his father. And to appease his divine wrath, Jason embarked in the Argo with a band of followers, the Argonauts, to retrieve the Golden Fleece. This was the fleece of the ram that had saved Phrixus at the last moment from being sacrificed. Triton, son of the sea god Poseidon, appeared in human form and gave one of the Argonauts, Euphemus, a gift of a handful of Libyan soil as a token of a promise that his descendants would return and colonize the land. Had Euphemus succeeded in keeping the soil to plant appropriately in his own home area, his descendants would have returned to colonize only four generations later. But since the soil was washed overboard and its particles landed on the island of Thera instead, 17 generations would have to pass and Cyrene would have to be colonized by the descendants of the Argonauts after first settling in Thera. This is the reverse of the order in which we read of the sacrifice and the promise in the biblical narrative. There Abraham is promised a land and afterward prepares to sacrifice Isaac. The Argonauts seek to appease Zeus's anger of the attempted sacrifice of Phrixus by retrieving the fleece of the ram that saved him, and the promise of the land of Cyrene for the descendants of the Argonauts is made afterwards. Generations later, after the descendants of the Argonauts had settled on Thera, a direct descendant of Euphemus was commanded through the Delphic Oracle to lead his people to settle and establish Cyrene in fulfillment of the promise made at the time of the Argonauts were retrieving the fleece of the ram that had saved Phrixus. This descendant was known as Batus, a name that means stutterer. He argued against the divine command on the ground that he was not a great warrior and that he had a speech impediment. But the Delphic Oracle refused to listen to reason 
and made him do as he was told anyway. This sounds like Moses. Herodotus tells us that Battus ruled Cyrene for the familiar 40 years. Hmm, that doesn't sound familiar. We are reminded of the promise to Abraham that his descendants would settle in Canaan after 400 years of slavery in Egypt. Egypt serves as a delaying detour on their way to their destiny, as Thera was in the Greek myth. God commands Moses to lead his people to Canaan by invoking his promise to give it to the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses at first refuses by pleading that he stutters. If Battus ruled the Argonauts for 40 years, Moses, also once called a king and known as a king in Philo, led his people for 40 years also. This narrative structure joining Abraham to Moses echoes with accuracy the promise made to Euphemus and its fulfillment by descendant Battus. Both Moses and Battus invoked their trouble speaking in order to avoid their divine mission and both ruled over their people during 40 years. Therefore, the similarities between the interrupted sacrifice of Isaac and that of Phrixus appear as part of a similar narrative structure. It seems as though Abraham plays two different characters from the Greek epic. King Athamas, who almost sacrificed his son Phrixus, an episode from the beginning of the epic, and the Argonaut Euphemus, who received the promise of land for his descendants, an episode from the ending of the epic. The order of the episodes has been reversed in the same way the detail of the ram hung on the tree after the sacrifice in the Greek version appears inverted to the account of the ram stuck in the bush before the sacrifice in Genesis. To repeat a few lines I quoted in my earlier post, this is Neil Godfrey speaking, but this time without the omissions. Parallelisms must not be analyzed in an isolated way. But one must try to find out the possible narrative structure that links the similarities together. In other words, the similarity between Phrixus and Isaac is not sufficient by itself to speculate about any possible borrowing. But when placed in the wider framework of the Epic of the Argonauts and the foundation of the colony of Cyrene, it allows us to question a likely influence of the Greek mythical tradition on the writings of the Old Testament. Philip Wagenbaum notes that his thesis supports the one advanced by Jan Wim Wesselius. In the origin of the history of Israel, Herodotus's histories as the blueprint for the first books of the Bible, that the narratives in Herodotus have influenced the biblical narrative. But there is one significant clue thus far missing. Wagenbaum's remarks. What might the founding of a colony in Cyrene and Herodotus have to do with the settlement and kingdom established in Canaan by Israel? Wagenbaum points to an answer. We must investigate the writings of another famous Greek writer to find the description of a state meant to be a colony, a state that would be divided into 12 tribes and ruled by perfect God-given laws the ideal state imagined by Plato in his laws. How late was the Bible and who really wrote it? Neil Godfrey again comes through, as has Russell Gamirkin and several of the scholars we've brought up so far. But I'm impressed with what Neil puts here. Here's what he has to say. It has become a truism that the Bible, or let's be specific and acknowledge, we are discussing the Old Testament or Jewish Hebrew Bible, is a collection of various books composed by multiple authors over many years. All of these authors are said to have coincidentally testified to the one and only true God of the Jewish people. The mere fact that multiple authors spanning generations wrote complementary works, all directed at the reality of this God working in human affairs, is considered proof 
that we are dealing with a cultural and religious heritage, a common tradition belonging to a single people over time. A few scholars have challenged that thesis, and the most recently published of these is Philip Wagenbaum. He writes, to have a single writer for Genesis through Kings and possibly for other biblical books contradicts the idea of the transmission of the divine word and of a tradition proper to a people. The idea of a single author does not conflict with the understanding that the sources of the Bible were drawn from archives of Israelite and Judahite kings, as well as Mesopotamian and Canaanite and other sources. Wachenbaum claims that the traditional scholarly hypotheses of authorship and origins of the Bible are in fact secular rationalizations of cultural myths about the Bible. Let us imagine that Judea has now been conquered for a century, and its sacerdotal class is now fully Hellenized. A man educated in the Greek fashion, perhaps in Alexandria, has grown up learning all the Greek classics, Homer, Hesiod, Herodotus, the great tragic playwrights, Plato, and that which he may have read in the Alexandrian canon established by Aristophanes of Byzantium and Aristarchus of Samothrace. He wants to create a literary work that can compete with those he has read, one that will give birth to his political and religious utopia, Israel. On the one hand, theories about the origins of the Bible tend to admit that the same writer wrote some books. On the other hand, several books and articles compare Greek myths with the Bible. It is the absence of a synthesis of all these data that is questioned here. Could it be the other way around? Philip Wagenbaum rejects the alternative suggestion that it may have been the Greeks who were influenced by the Bible or related stories from cultures neighboring the Jews. Essentially, the reasons for resisting this idea are, one, Greek authors were generally identifiable personally, and they quite openly referred to their predecessors and contemporaries whom they emulated and imitated. They had no need to copy the Bible and leave no evidence that they had any awareness of it. Two, the Greeks portrayed their myths through painting and sculpture. And here, there's no suggestion of borrowing from Jewish myths. The only contemporary images from Palestine are Canaanite relics. Three, Wajimbaum argues that almost every chapter of the Bible corresponds to a Greek myth whereas the opposite is not true. Four, Greek myths are linked together in a logical narrative progression from the birth of the gods themselves down to the Trojan War and the beginnings of the historical era. This rich and complex intertextuality has allowed the biblical writer to create an original epic on a fantastic level of sophistication. We will see how the Greek mythical genealogies have been dismantled and reconstructed through a specific filter. I hope that everybody watching this goes and subscribes to Neil Godfrey's blog. He is doing fantastic work mining scholars that are not well known, and we're highlighting them today. Please show him your appreciation. Show Russell Gamirkin much of his work was shown in this documentary. And I want more people to show support to the good scholars we bring forward here on Myth Vision. To be continued. As we unravel the intricate narratives of the Bible, it becomes increasingly evident that understanding Abraham's tale requires a detour through the annals of Hellenistic lore. This synthesis of Greco-Biblical traditions isn't merely an exercise in historical curiosity, but a pivotal key to truly grasping the layers and intricacies of Biblical narratives. If today's exploration has piqued your interest, I urge you to like this video 
subscribe to our channel and join the conversation in the comments below. I hope you tell us what your favorite part of this video was. We're just scratching the surface and there's so much more to uncover in our upcoming series on the origins of the Bible. To get exclusive content and early access to our episodes, consider supporting our quest by joining our Patreon community. You'd also become part of our family. Together, we'll navigate the rich tapestry of ancient narratives and the profound lessons they hold for the modern world. Until then, keep delving, keep questioning, and stay curious. Oh, and never forget, we are Mythvision.